Good morning, everyone. I'm Nicola Barrett, uh, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. Wonderful to have you all join us this morning. This month, we're driving into technology and digital disruption. And I'm excited about today's topic because it's really relevant. We've been hearing a lot about it in the news. It's about the up and the down, upside and the downside of generative artificial intelligence. And many of you will have heard about apps like ChatGPT. And our session title speculates, uh, you know, are machines coming for our jobs? We're constantly generating data in our personal and our work lives. We both generate and rely on data. My car believes it knows where I'm going before I even put it into reverse. And more often than not, it's correct. Today's session centers on how artificial intelligence is leveraging data in predictive, generative, or other ways. What roles might AI fulfill that are currently performed by you, your employees, or your teenage um, school student who's got that essay to write? What biases and cautions might we as business professionals need to consider before turning work over to the machines? We are welcoming back Chaired Professor of Marketing, David Schreidel, to explore these questions and others as he shares his research, insights, and admonitions when it comes to generative AI. A self-described data junkie, David focuses his research on customer relationship marketing, social media analytics, and innovative ways data and emerging technologies can both inform strategy and execution. He leverages the development and application of statistical models to understand customer behavior, which in turn can influence managerial decisions. To have a little fun with this session, David actually generated both the title and the session description that you might have seen on LinkedIn for this webinar using ChatGPT. I certainly wouldn't have known if I hadn't been told beforehand. Before I hand things over to David, I want to highlight an opportunity uh, to learn more about this subject and its impact for business. If you're finding yourself at a loss about what to do about or with these new technologies and you feel you need to better inform and equip yourself and your colleagues, then I strongly suggest you consider joining the AI and machine learning for business executives that we have in our in the, starting in April. Um, we'll put a link uh, to the relevant website page in the chat and you can also reach out to Tammy Long if you have questions about this. As usual, um, before uh, David is going to spend the next sort of 30 to 35 minutes sharing his insights, um, he welcomes your engagement. So please use the chat and the Q&A throughout the webinar, and we will do our best to um, answer as many questions as you have. Over to you, David. All right, thanks a lot, Nicola, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, let me get things fired up and we'll jump right into things. You know, this is, as Nicola had mentioned, a uh, very popular topic. I was just watching the CBS morning show uh, before heading in and was they had a, um, a similar segment uh, airing. So I was curious to hear uh, their take on things. And I was glad to see not all that dissimilar uh, from what I'm gonna be talking about today, but I think we'll go into a little bit more depth uh, than they were able to on that morning show. All right, so what are we talking about? Just to make sure that we're all on the same page when we're talking about AI. You know, like many of you, my view of AI was, was shaped by what I saw in Hollywood. To, to be clear, we're not talking about the Terminator or Jarvis or Ultron um, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, we're not at that stage of being anywhere near concerned about, you know, the machine overlord subjugating humanity and roaming the earth. What we are talking about, though, are automated systems that we have come to rely on more and more frequently that replicate and can mimic human tasks. And that's where the idea of uh, artificial intelligence is coming from. So wanted to st wanted to share with you, um, you know, places where you've probably seen AI already, but you might not have thought about it um, in those terms. You know, so this is these are just some of the places where artificial intelligence has already been deployed, and this is taking a very you know this is taking a very broad view of AI in the sense that it's I have data as an input, 
I build a model and I automate an action based on the results. So new data comes in, I analyze that data, I automate the output. So you can think of the online advertising that we see as part of this. Think of autocomplete that you see um, in your emails or in chat or your interactions with chatbots. These are all forms of artificial intelligence. But if we think about kind of the nature of these interactions, they're much more restricted than what we're, what we're seeing from chat GPT and um, other what are referred to as generative AI. So that's what we're gonna be focused around uh, today. You know, Stephen, I see, you know, the, the, the comment that you had just posted um, around your company um, providing guidance to not use ChatGPT for deliverables. Um, I think there's there's a nuance to that, that that we're going to get into. And it really touches on that question of how far can you take AI and how much role does the human expert need to play in this process? As I'll share with you some of our results, the human, even though the hours that might need to go into generating something might be reduced, that human involvement is critical. All right, so let me share with you what some of the experts have said about AI. Jeffrey Hinton um, regarded as kind of one of the, the key thought leaders around artificial intelligence had made this statement back in 2016 that we should no longer train radiologists. Um, and radiology has been one of the key areas where we've seen artificial intelligence applied in um, a healthcare context because it's very well suited to AI. There's a lot of data in the form of images. We have analyzed that data. Radiologists have looked at that data, say, this is cancer, this is not cancer. And based on that human classification, we can train the AI to automatically classify a new image coming in. But as many of you probably know, well, we still have radiologists, we still train them. And so even though you know, the technology is there and it's able, to do, it's able to accurately assess images, we still have people in these roles. Part of that is because of the stakes of the decisions that are being made. But part of this is also because we as consumers, we as people still have some reluctance when it comes to interacting uh, with AI rather than interacting with a person. Uh, an, another luminary, um, Daniel Kahneman, um, Nobel Prize winner, um, had said, you know, to, you know, to make it clear, you know, AI is going to win it from an, you know, compared to human intelligence. The question is, how are we going to adjust? And what I liked about this quote is, you know, he acknowledges this is the direction that we're going in. Uh, he sees no doubt in this. What he does question is how we as a society are going to evolve with this. And I think that's there are multiple facets that come into play here of how as we we as people, we as a society, we as a workforce. You know, there are two different facts. Those are two different perspectives that we have to take on. You know. Um, Will, Will, you you asked, you know, is there is ChatGPT sentient? Um, I, I'm going to kind of take Google's view, and this was an issue that had come up with regards to one of their engineers claiming that AI had gained sentience. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about the underpinnings of ChatGPT. Yeah, this is an algorithm. This is uh, this is not sentience. It is a very good word and conversation generator, but we're not at the point where these machines have achieved uh, sentience, at least, you know, as far as I know. Um, and Gary, you know, to your comment, to everyone, I think this is, you hit the nail on the head. People are the final decision makers. People are the ones that still ultimately bear uh, responsibility for this. And in fact, there was a scientific uh, journal, I forget whether it was Science or Nature, who had come out with the declaration, AI cannot be a co-author on research because co-authors are accountable and we cannot hold an AI accountable. Uh, Sarah, your question in the chat about IP, give me a, give me a little while because I definitely want to touch on this question. I'm working on something right now with a legal collaborator um, very much tr trying to probe this. It's very murky right now. I have my predictions for where it's going to head, so I'll share those with you um, in a little bit. All right. 
So is this something that we need to worry about? Is this the future that we're heading toward? You know, as some people have referred to it of the dystopian hellscape. I don't think so. I, 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 assuming that we as people are not entirely complacent, I don't think we're, we're aiming for a world where people are entirely replaced by machines. And I think this is something that we can look back at history to see how technology has forced us to evolve. You know, if we think about the, the advent of ATMs, it changed the way that we do our banking, but it hasn't replaced the branch office. If we think about the advent of you know, the calculator, all right, well, the calculator made things faster for us. We learned how to use uh, the calculator in our workflow, um, but we haven't gotten to the point where we say, okay, the calculator is going to do any, do everything for us. You know, I, prior to um, going back to school and studying marketing, I worked as an actuary for a couple of summers and, you know, actuaries, which, yeah, a great career path for those um, suited to it, still a very desirable job um, in and still an in-demand in job. So assuming that we react appropriately, I don't think the world we're heading to is one where we as workers are entirely replaced by AI. So we do have to recognize there are parts of our jobs, there are tasks that can be heavily automated. And that's something where I think it, we've been resistant to it recently because there's a question of, well, how broad are those tasks that can potentially uh, be automated? So I think going into that and, you know, requires understanding first, where are we as consumers? How do we feel about this? As well as understanding kind of the underpinnings of these technologies. So these are just some of the, sur some of the surveys that have been done recently. This one's a little bit later. Um, or this was conducted a little bit earlier. And you can see one of the things people are excited about, there's excitement around the notion of I can perform, or that it can perform repetitive tasks in the workplace, that it might be able to perform household chores for me more easily. You know, I was just having this conversation with my wife around, you know, should we ask ChatGPT to do our meal planning for us? And say, okay, give me a meal plan, put together my grocery list. Is it gonna save me a ton of time? No. But is it going to save me time from doing something that I might consider a little bit more arduous? There's a lot of excitement around that. Um, and not a whole lot of concern from people. Where we are seeing concerns, and this touches on one of the comments that I saw in the uh, pop up in the chat, was the nature of the decisions that are being made and knowing people's thoughts. And that's a, you know, that notion of privacy, that, that's a big one. Um, and this is one of the places where I'm a big proponent that AI needs to be regulated as quickly as the technology evolves. Yeah, I'm not sure that I trust our government to be able to keep up uh, with the pace that the tech companies are operating at. And I see that as one of the bigger risks uh, that we as a society are going to be facing. Right? Uh, but here's a more recent survey that was conducted by eMarketer looking at the, you know, how people view AI. and you know, a couple of things really popped out to me that I wanted to uh, wanted to share with this group. Right? You know, if you look at the top part, you're, you're, we're, the top graph, we're looking at about 50% of people saying they somewhat or strongly agree with the fact that we should use AI to replace certain work tasks. And there's more than 60% saying, you know, use AI in the workplace to save time and resources. Uh, so there is a general acknowledgement that AI can be useful in the workplace. And as Gary no noted in the chat, the key question is going to be for what tasks can we do this? Right? There are tasks that are incredibly well suited to AI. There are tasks that are horribly suited to AI. And the last question um, yeah, that is raised here around AI generated written works containing biases and inaccuracies. This is one of the biggest limitations. You know, let me see if I can blow up this graph um, a little a, a little bit. Give me one second, uh, Gary, to see, see if I can. I don't know if that makes it any clearer, um, you know, for you guys. But yeah, we're, you know, th there's a general acknowledgement that AI systems, because of the way that they're built. Um, 
replicate biases and contain factual errors because these systems are only as good as the data that was used to build them. Where did that data come from? It came ultimately from people. Uh, so that's, the, that's part of the issue that we have is we have to understand how these systems work, what are their limitations, and then we can make that informed decision around how we're going to choose to use them. So let me give a very brief primer um, on you know, this class of models called uh, GPT. So GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer, Transformer being the type of model. This was developed by a lab that was co-founded by Elon Musk called OpenAI. The, the key academic paper was written, I believe, in 2018 or 2019. And since then, they've been iterating this model. Um, you know, so you can see GPT-2, GPT-3, and now more, most recently, chat GPT. And what the reason I wanted to share this is, well, it all of a sudden entered, you know, the zeitgeist. These models have been with us for, you know, quite some time now, at least in kind of um, technology years. And Michael, your comment, I think, is going to be spot on, as I'll share with you some examples of you know, again, AI is, you know, AI is designed to mimic human intelligence. Human intelligence is not infallible. And so we've got to recognize that. We have to be cognizant of that because when you as a, you know, you as a company make a decision, the person who authorized that decision is the one responsible for it. You can't just say, well, it's the machine's fault. So what happened between the release of GPT-3 that you know, me and my data geek colleagues found super cool and 2023. You know, what really changed? Well, some of the tools that were already in place, some of you um, within a marketing sphere may recognize this, tools like Jasper that say you can write your marketing copy 10 times faster using existing tools. You can write blog posts. You can write more engaging emails. You can do all of these things from a copywriting standpoint. This was already happening back in 2020 with the release of GPT-3, but ChatGPT really kicked things into gear because all of a sudden it, it was AI made accessible to people, right? It wasn't that I have to know programming in order to access this tool. All of a sudden I can use this just like I would use any type of, of chatbot. Uh, and so here are some of the applications that others have um, demonstrated already or that I've demonstrated. I've, I've taken an outline and had it draft uh, a proposal for funding. I've looked at how can this do in terms of giving me a, a potential syllabus for a new class. I've demonstrated using this to write cover letters, to write emails to people. I had a colleague that said, reformat my reference list in a particular style. Uh, a popular use of AI has been to summarize articles. And then most recently, I was working on this yesterday. I am not a Linux person. I ask my um, tech team whenever possible, can you give me a graphical user interface? But I needed to do something in Linux. And rather than going downstairs and asking IT to come and help me, I said, well, let me put my question into ChatGPT and ask it to give me the instructions. And it was able to. So those are some of the use cases that have been demonstrated already. For those of you that haven't looked at this in depth already, let me share with you um, just kind of the interface to be able to do this so you can see why this has captivated people recently. Um, so this, you should be able to see the chat GPT interface. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll toss into questions, um, you know, at, touching on some of the comments that have come up. So should we... As a society, worry about AI potentially harming us more than it helps us. And let's see what it gives us. And this is in real time. And so you can see it produces what looks to be intelligible responses, right? But 
Is it guaranteed to be factually accurate? Absolutely not. Um, I will give you a couple of cases though where it's demonstrated where we've seen already the potential for AI during the pandemic. Uh, using the predecessor of ChatGPT, um, it was asked how um, how countries would react to the pandemic, and it was fairly accurate in producing the responses of different countries to the global pandemic. It was also um, asked to predict how COVID would evolve, and it accurately predicted um, the structure of one of the COVID variants um, that we end, that we ended up encountering. Now, that isn't to say it's guaranteed to get it right 100 times, because they might have produced 1,000 variants, and only one of them uh, would be accurate. Uh, yeah. Kevin, I don't know of any faculty who are currently using a, or are currently trying to kind of weed out um, AI being used to write papers. I actually threw down the gauntlet with my students when I gave them their midterm this week because I don't think that, that ChatGPT would help them uh, with the midterm other than to break writer's block. Um, so let, let me share with you, you know, going back, let me give you one other application, you know, non-academic application, just see. How might this be useful to you um, from an everyday life standpoint? Um, I'll rerun this chat. Um, so this is, you know, for my family, you know, we're looking for a meal plan three days each week for four weeks, four people. I gave it some of the constraints that we face. Um, my, my wife doesn't care for fish. My daughter doesn't like um, anything spicy. And each meal should have a protein and a vegetable and limit pasta dishes. And let's regenerate this one. And so you can just see, again, oh, try reloading the conversation. All right, I'll give it a shot. So you can see AI is not perfect. I don't like that response. Um, let me see if I can try. If not, we'll just rerun it again. All right, that one's not gonna help me. Let's run up a new chat. Give me a me give me a meal plan for someone actively working out, looking to build muscle mass. All right. And so here's a sample meal plan based on what I asked it to do. Now, those of you who are more into fitness than I am can be the arbiters of whether or not this is a good meal plan. But yeah, this is just to illustrate how much these kinds of tools can be incorporated um, in your, your everyday life. All right, so let me switch back over to slides. Now that I've just shown you what you can do with this, um, you know, where are we going with this? So ChatGPT, incredibly popular. Within five days, it hit a million users. You can see the contrast to companies like Netflix, Airbnb, Instagram, Spotify, off the charts in terms of the level of interest with it. But here was something I didn't expect. So again, another chart from eMarketer looking at familiarity with ChatGPT um, among U.S. adults. Uh, you know, the overall response, uh, let's see, so 36% of women, 57% of men, significant difference across age, range, age ranges. Um, those who are older, we're seeing um, only about a third of people being familiar with it, uh, whereas younger generation, 18 to 29, you're seeing almost 60% uh, being familiar with it. And then what struck me is the, the what we're seeing by education level. So those with postgraduate degrees, you know, already 57% of people very familiar with it, whereas those with a high school education or, or less, not necessarily being familiar with it. And that's something that I find a little bit troubling because of the potential workforce implications uh, that this is going to have. All right, so how do these tools work? Well, these tools, at the end of the day, these are statistical models. So statistical models require data. In this case, lots and lots of data. So what they've done is they've scoured the internet in order to collect data, both textual data as well as image-related data, right? And they build a massive database on which they've trained uh, these models. Now, just to give you a sense for the cost of training these models, um, the prior generation um, of ChatGPT, GPT-3, I believe was pegged at somewhere in the tens of millions of dollars. 
just to build the model. And that's not just, that's not all human cost. That is electrical and computing cost that we're talking about. That's one, that's one of the reasons AI has the partnership um, with Microsoft because they need that computing power to be able to do this. So they've scoured the internet, they've collected a lot of data and they've built a model. Now, again, it's not just text. They're also scouring the internet for images. So there's an image database containing nearly 6 billion images. Um, and that was designed for research purposes. But this gets to the, the, um, the question that was raised earlier around copyright um, and IP, because a lot of the images in this database that are being used, well, they were created by someone. And so the way that in which they're being used may actually violate copyright. Uh, Dwight, you asked the question of what happens to all the data that you put into ChatGPT? Who owns it? My understanding is the data we put into ChatGPT is actually being used by OpenAI to refine the model. So they are taking possession of that data. Um, very similar to the social media platforms, when you post something online, you are giving those social media companies the rights to use it. I don't think you give up your, your IP, but you have given them the, uh, a, a royalty-free license to use that data. Uh, Ope, the you know, question of where is this data coming from? Um, there's one of the big sources of data is a project called Common Crawl. Um, and uh, that information, not at all made transparent, but it's, you know, Think of anything that is public on the internet being fair game uh, for these models, both the, and that's both the good and the bad. All right. So what do these models do? And this is an illustration using the, pre, the prior generation, but these are predictive models. So given a particular set of words, given a sequence, what goes around, what are the next most likely words to show up? And so that's the model that's being run. So going through all of the text that we've acquired, the, what these tools are doing is trying to predict the next most likely sequence of words. What ChatGPT has done is add on to that in AI that is conversational in nature. Right. Now, this is how text generation is working, and ChatGPT got made incredibly popular. But what I wanted to share with you is another branch of generative AI, which I think is even more transformative than ChatGPT. This is an image generative model. And so the way these image generative models work is you provide a segment of text. And so that's what I've circled on the bottom. That is the text that was provided to the generative AI. And it generates images for you based on what we've put it, what we've put into the, as the text. And so the way it's doing that is it has data that, that contains both an image and text. It is finding those images that are related to the, that have text associated with what you put in, and it's generating a new image. Um, and so, for example, you can see clearly, all right, I can see Kermit the Frog. Doesn't exactly look like Kermit the Frog. He's got an extra eye. He's got a couple of extra legs. But it does a reasonably good job of conjuring the idea of what you had entered. Um, and just to show you kind of how this generative AI for images has been used, these are some examples of images that are entirely manufactured, uh, entirely artificial, uh, demonstrated by this. Uh, we've got a website, these people do not exist. They sure look like actual people. Um, another one that's being used is to generate variants of artwork. Um, so you can see the girl with the pearl earring um, being used to say, okay, well, I want to generate a variant of that. All of these images in the same style as the original. So you can see the similarities, you can see the similarities in the style, in the pose, in the color palette, um, but being able to be generated virtually at no cost, at least as of now, no financial cost. Um, this other set of images that I picked out here, this is taken from another website, um, you know, as far as being able to generate images from these prompts. And this all comes down to really the creativity that goes into these prompts. You know, Stephen, your question about the deep fakes of public figures, very, very similar technology. 
Uh, so definitely something that we need to be weary of because it used to be the case that we could rely on visuals as kind of evidence. You know, you think about kind of the old idea of somebody who's been kidnapped, let's hold up a copy of the newspaper. We look at the date on the newspaper and say, okay, we, we believe this picture was taken um, on this day because you've got the newspaper. Well, think how easy it is to generate something artificial now. So being able to insert public figures into situations where they haven't been, that's definitely something that we have to be worried about as a society. You know, this notion of provenance, you know, in the art world of what's the history of the artwork, we almost need something analogous for all images that we see right now. We need to know who created that image. Is it coming directly from the source to me? Or am I being shown an image that was created by someone else? And there's an intermediary that might have gotten involved with this. These are all issues that we really have to grapple with. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about it from a societal standpoint, but think about it from a brand standpoint. I can very easily generate imagery that depicts brands in ways or in circumstances that a brand might not want to, to appear, right? And so this is one of the issues right now that my colleagues and I are working on talking about the IP implications of this because there are, there are steps that brands should be taking today. They should be proactive in this regard, all right? So happy to talk about that um, with anyone who's interested um, offline. You know, today we're focused more on what should we be doing from a workforce uh, perspective. So I, I, I'm of two minds of this because from a data geek, from a statistician perspective, these tools are phenomenally interesting. From a member of society perspective, you know, Brian, as you had just put it, it's a little disturbing. Right, what we're capable of doing with these tools is incredibly scary. So there's a balancing act. And I would go so far as to say, for the companies that are investing in pushing these tools forward, I hope that they're investing as much in developing the guardrails in real time, because they're the only ones who are really in a position to understand the technology well enough to be able to build uh, those guardrails for us. Right. So let me touch on some of the, the limitations we know of. We've already hit on the notion of biases uh, and factual inaccuracies. Um, let me share with you just an illustration of the bias that's present in these models. Um, oh, I must have deleted uh, the slide. Well, AI systems have been used for um, hiring practices, for evaluating applicants. Well, tech firms have had a systematic problem uh, with gender balance. So imagine an AI that was trained to hire um, prospective employees that look like my current employees. Well, if 80% of my current employees are men, what is the AI going to start doing? It's going to start having, um, it's going to start discriminating against women because it's trained to say, hire men, hire people who look like my current workforce. Um, the other limitations that we that that we know of, kind of the contextual knowledge, these generative models are at least off the shelf. ChatGPT, very broad knowledge base, but doesn't go uh, very deep. You know, the other piece that we'll talk about is the copyright infringement. There are a couple of active lawsuits um, in this space uh, that that I'll touch on if we have time. And Brian, you mentioned, you know, just watch that um, documentary on coded bias. Absolutely. Same issues coming into play. These models are only as good as the data sets used to train them. What that means is we have to be on the lookout for gender bias. We have to be on the lookout for racial bias. We have to be on the lookout for any type of bias that a person is subject to. You know, we have to be on the lookout for it. William, you know, your, your point about can we trust legislators to do this? You know, I hope they get on, I hope they get the wake-up call that they need to act on this, but I don't think they have the knowledge to act on it. I don't think they can operate at the pace of technology innovation. I think it's going to be incumbent upon companies that are investing in AI and the companies that are building the AI tools. And I draw a distinction between them. There are the AI developers like OpenAI and Microsoft that are investing in them. 
they're responsible for developing some of this, but also as a user of the AI, the companies that say, I'm going to license this technology and use it, they have to also be um, investing in responsible uh, usage. Um, I just want to pause, because Michael, you had put a comment in the chat that, you know, really struck me about kind of, you know, the notion of deep fakes, the dangers that, you know, that they pose, how we spot them. You know, this is something that we definitely need to deal with. And, you know, I go back to this issue of we need that provenance of the image of how do you go about proving something is real or not proving something is real. There, the combination of unregulated social media platforms with AI is a recipe for misinformation on steroids. And so there, you know, there is going to be this active war on truth that we have to be ready to combat that. And what you know, I would say for public figures that's going to hold and for brands that's going to hold of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this on the fly, but I almost feel as though you, you know, companies are going to need an active, you know, misinformation combat team in order to respond to, to this content because of how easy it is to generate, how hard it is to spot and how quickly it can be disseminated. So, Michael, you know, I wish I had more that I could share around ways in which we can go about combating, uh, you know, deep fakes. But it's going to require really, in, uh, you know, a large scale effort by both society and by individual businesses um, to start addressing that issue. All right. So, where should our concern um, come into play? Okay. Where should workers be concerned? Well, you know, I've shared with you about the generative AI already. This is what we um, ChatGPT told me of, you know, should should we, you know, what jobs are going to be eliminated? What jobs will be created? Because I think part of what gets lost in this conversation is that new jobs are going to be created. All right, you know, Gary, you know, um, will your comments around capitalism and ethics? absolutely crucial but i would also i would go even a step further the ethical the ethics conversation has to be specific to ai you know broad based business ethics classes aren't going to be enough anymore we have to drill down and say how are we going to use ai what are the responsible ways of doing it so you can see you know ai is touching on the fact that there will be job creation there will be job destruction um, and I think the reason that it's getting so much attention now is there's been a shift. Like we, we used to think about automation as replacing a lot of blue collar jobs. What ChatGPT has revealed is white collar jobs are not immune to automation anymore. Right? Um, let me share with you um, kind of my perspective as well as some examples. Um, you know, so this was a Sun Tzu quote. For some reason, the art of war really struck me as being relevant in, in thinking about how do today's employees and arguably today's students um, need to think about AI. And yeah, I think this quote really says it. It's you need to be you need to become the enemy. If you think of AI as potentially your enemy, you need to know your enemy. And you know, I've said this to, to folks, and it it seems to resonate. Don't worry about AI taking your job. Worry about someone who knows how to use the AI replacing you, because that person who knows how to use the AI is going to be more efficient on the job than you are today without the AI in many circumstances. So here's the question for us is, you know, this is where we had been, and you know, I was having uh, coffee yesterday um, with someone I'd have been in, been introduced to, to. Um, and he said, "This is where how we think of it, right? You know, what it has been is the manager is tell is telling the employee what to do, and the employee is the one doing all the hard work. Well, that's one world that we can love that we can live in. Here's a different world where." You know, the manager you know, the, you know, is ultimately the one that the employee is serving, but the employee's job is a little bit easier than it used to be. We're letting AI take on the hard work. And so you know, if we think about AI through that lens, like, okay, I still have a job. It's a, you know, my job is different though. My job has evolved. Uh, so I'm not saying that there aren't going to be jobs that are lost, uh, but 
the, if we think about AI as removing some of the tasks and having the potential to make our jobs easier, you know, essentially, where can I reallocate my effort to the point that it adds that it adds more value? And Brian, just looking at one of the questions or comments you had posted in, in the Q&A, you talked about the metrics and measurements. This is absolutely going to change the way that we view uh, productivity, productivity and output because it's no, you know, we're still interested in how much output are we getting from a given employee, but we should expect that we can get more output from a given employee now that we're equipping them uh, with AI. So how does business practice evolve? Well, there's a phrase that's popular within the machine learning uh, community, the human in the loop. And this is where essentially what this says is we need a person in the process. Why? Because we're the ultimate decision makers. We're the ones bearing responsibility for what the AI comes back with. So by all means, rely on the AI. Let the AI do the heavy lifting for you but you're still going to need a person in the role of oversight, or as someone else had put it, where our jobs are going to shift from creation to curation. So let me share with you what I see as a couple of the new jobs that are going to emerge or skills that are going to become more important for employees. There, the phrase prompt engineering has emerged um, in the lexicon recently. And what prompt engineering refers to is developing te uh, the textual prompts in order to really manipulate the AI into giving you what you want. Um, as we've seen with image generators, the more specific prompts you provide to it, um, the better the artwork is going to become. Let me share with you one website um, you know, that I've taken to using um, Lexica Art. And I just want to share with you, um, because what they, what they do here is not only do they show you the images that have been generated, but they also show you the prompt that has been used to generate that image. And so if I take a look at Darth Vader, like, you know, so what is the, so this one is relatively simple, Darth Vader on trial courtroom sketch, black and white. Let me see if I can find a prompt that's a little bit more detailed in terms of what, um, what it took in order to generate it. If not, I'll try one other website um, that's known for um, being um, you know, much more detailed in the prompts that it generates. Um, so if we take a look at what was the prompt that went into generating this kind of fantasy landscape, and you can see this is all the text that was used to generate. So this isn't as simple as one sentence necessarily. There's a lot of manipulation that potentially goes into this. And to give you just one more example, um, there's an entire marketplace that has been created where the people who have created these prompts are actively selling them, right? So there is going to be a new skill set that emerges in terms of what you know, how do I go about generating the text, whether it's for images or how do I get the most out of something like a chat GPT? That's a new skill set that I think is going to emerge. The other skill that I think is going to emerge, and we've started to see traces of this already, is the role of the algorithmic auditor. You know, a lot of these algorithms, they're black boxes to us. So what that means is I'm not going to be able to read through lines of code in order to spot um, you know, potential biases. What it means is I need to stress test an algorithm before I put it into use. And so I've shown you here kind of you know, the UK government website. The other is an HBR, Harvard Business Review article um, written by a friend, Jim Gusha, who um, was the chief scientist um, at Deloitte. I'm um, saying we need, we need to audit algorithms. Right, because we can't let the genie out of the bottle if we know it's going to produce harm. Um, let me take a pause for a moment because a couple of questions um, came up in the Q and A that I wanted to address. Uh, Samra, uh, where do you sell the prompts for generative AI images? There is a marketplace. Marketplace is called PromptBase.com. That's the one that I know of um, that has emerged already, um, and I'll I'll put the uh, link to it. Um, 
in the in the in the chat window. Um, so promptbase.com is the one that uh, um, that I've seen. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are others that are starting to emerge. There are Q and A's already emerge. Um, there are courses already emerging of kind of how do I use these sites? How do I get the most out of ChatGPT? How do I generate imagery? So this has become a very hot skill set um, that uh, you know that I think is one that you know appropriately, um, you know, done, you know, appro developing this skill set is going to make you more valuable because that the AI is no longer a threat to you. You understand how you can use it and you get a better understanding of the tasks that you can do with the AI. Um, Stephen and Howard both asking around who's tasked with these audits um, and, you know, kind of where does the responsibility lie? Uh, you know, it's going to be on the user. Right. It ultimately, if you're using this AI, you need to make sure that it, it's appropriate for your use case. But before you use it for something, ultimately, you know, you're responsible for its use. And so within an organization, this is something that needs to be developed. So, you know, I sitting within marketing, you know, I'll say, OK, what should marketers be doing with this? Well, if I'm using this for personalization, I, you know, let's say I want to send out. Um, you know, um, emails, I want to send out customized messaging to people before I hit the button that says go, I better know that this is not going to do something that I would be embarrassed about. Samra mentioned in the Q&A that in the enterprise, um, there are model validation teams for auditing algorithms. And I think we need more of that. I don't think that, you know, as AI infuses itself into multiple aspects of the organization, we're talking about HR, we're talking about marketing, we're talking about IT. You need dedicated teams to vet these algorithms. And as the algorithms evolve, this is going to be kind of an ongoing job. I mean, think almost think about, you know, so within the company, we need this. Within the government, we need this. I mean, it's almost like I need another, ver I need a dedicated agency that is staffed by people who actually understand these algorithms. Uh, why we need to do this, you know, again, you know many examples of this already in practice, uh, here we go. But here's, you know, gender discrimination, racial discrimination, um, you know, discrimination based on other factors that, that we don't intend for these things to creep into practice. But the fact that these algorithms are black boxes, that they're trained on human created data that is entirely fallible, we have to make sure that we're responsibly using the AI. All right, so where can we embrace the AI on just being mindful on the time? Well, repetitive tasks. That's the easiest place for us to think about it. Tasks that are repetitive, there's not a lot of variation from case to, uh, from case, to case, and where there's a lot of data. Uh, you know, this was one stat that I had pulled. Nearly 90% of legal contracts, of multi-page legal contracts, are boilerplate language. You know, I have an attorney for the startup that we're trying to get off the ground and, you know, great attorney, but bills me every time we have a conversation, all right? If, if she can do the job more efficiently using AI and that's going to cut down on my bills, I'm happy to have her using that AI, all right? So some of the places that we're seeing this already, this is, a, this is actually a several year old example from IBM. IBM Watson um, partnered with uh, auto glass body repair. And what they did was you know, brilliant for anyone that's had body work done on their car, you know the hassle that it can be to get an estimate. They said, download our app, take a picture. We will compare that picture to our database that we've built over the years. And we're going to give you that estimate on, you know, on the spot. And what that did was it cut down the time that their employees were spending on these routine cases, allowing the employees to spend more time on the cases that were harder or on tasks where they added more value. You know, same idea, um, my collaborators and I have done work on SEO text generation. It's a you know, challenging context. It's one where the general process is the same every time. Um, in terms of the necessary workflow. But what we found was in building this AI with a, with a person at the end. So what the AI would do is say, here are 10 pieces of draft content. Pick one and revise it. 
because the content that came out of the AI was not usable. And what we found with the company that we worked with was 90% cost savings would have been possible using the AI rather than relying on human writers to do all of the work. So there's no question that there's a, a tremendous opportunity here for improvement where we still needed a person. We still needed a person at the end of the process to vet the content, make sure that it's accurate, make sure it's not offensive, make sure that it's in line um, with the brand standards. You know, Kevin, this you, you asked the question in the model around, what's the economic model that these companies are operating under? Right now, it's a, essentially a licensing model. It's where, you know, we've built this tool, you can use it, and you're going to pay us for using this tool once you kind of cross over the freemium model. Once you use it enough, we want you to pay to use it. So for ChatGPT, for example, I joined the group of people paying $20 a month um, to, to, for priority access to it. All right, you know, other places where we're gonna see this come into practice. Um, Microsoft is one of the big investors uh, in OpenAI we will see chat GPT functionality come into Microsoft uh, Office products, right? And so, you know, this was just one illustration. I have uh, one of my evening MBA students said to me, we had a team come in from Slalom uh, Consulting Company um, to, you know, to do, to do this. Um, and he said to me, he works in finance. He said, this tool replaces my assistant. I asked him what he meant. He said, I, I end up sending emails to my assistant to reformat things for me. If you put ChatGPT into Excel, I don't need that assistant anymore. So that shocked me that he, he thought from a just efficiency standpoint, ChatGPT would let him do that with, without the assistant. The place where there's a challenge though is that assistant is on kind of a you know, track within the organization for development. And so if I eliminate that assistant, I eliminate that development track. So that's one of the things that we've got to think about. Um, Jim, um, thanks for the question in the um, on, are we conducting certificate courses on, you know, related to this? Um, Nicola had mentioned the AI machine learning course. That is one of the programs that is currently running. Um, would love to hear from folks if there is interest in what we're talking about here in kind of the you know, prompt engineering and, uh, you know, kind of immediate upskilling, um, definitely something that we're, we would be interested in, in, in offering um, should we see uh, interest from the marketplace um, in that. Um, another place we're seeing this um, is coding. Um, the CBS story that I saw this morning um, in all around uh, coding and how, you know, the code that it writes, it's relatively generic. But again, a lot of code is relatively generic. So can it build a website for you? Yes. It's not gonna be a particularly exciting website. It's not gonna be a particularly compelling website. Again, it's all gonna depend on the prompt that is entered into it, what you get out of it. But my own experience, I don't know Linux. Using ChatGPT to get me the Linux code that I needed to accomplish my task probably got 80% of the job done for me, and I needed a little bit of help from one of my colleagues. So I think this is a place where we're going to see the work of coders change, because I'm not going to necessarily need them to do the coding grunt work time and time again. I am going to need them for the higher, more customization, higher value add. And for all of you know, the folks that are saying, well, you're eliminating the, you know, their jobs, and this is you know, going to hurt the workforce, one other stat that I would throw out there for you They've asked coders how they feel about their jobs after incorporating uh, AI, and they actually report higher job satisfaction because they are focusing on jobs where they feel like they are adding more. It's not just, I'm sitting here, I'm cranking the wheel, I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I, you know, I've automated that. I've let the AI take that. I get to allocate my skills to the place where I add a lot more value. Um, you know, just because it's come up in the chat, so I'm glad, um, and uh, Shisenta, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing uh, your name, this question around the role of graphic designers. I think, you know, one of the things I've heard is because of generative AI for images, uh, to some extent, the, the, the job life cycle from concept to final product 
is changing. That's one of the places where we are seeing um, a lot of use of um, AI for graphic design. But one of the other places is in this idea of synthetic media and synthetic people. So some of the people that you see on this slide are entirely computer generated. And so we're seeing companies turn to virtual influencers um, because there is yeah, there is a lot of savings in terms of time, in terms of efficiency that you get with virtual uh, virtual people rather than actual people. And you know, it reminded me a little bit of the deep fakes, but it also reminded me of a movie several, you know, more than a decade, maybe two decades at this point, Simone, where um, I think it was Al Pacino is a director and the movie star kind of throws a fit, walks out on the set, instead of hiring someone else, he makes one up, right? He makes up an AI movie star. Um, and, and what ended up happening here is it kind of spirals out of control, but that's what we're seeing. If you think about text can be generated, images can be generated, sound can be generated. Your voice can now be replicated with only three seconds of your audio content. So if any of you remember the movie Sneakers, um, you know, my voice is my passport was the voice lock that they needed. Um, that is reality today. So these are some of the things, for, again, from a tech standpoint, fascinating, but from a societal standpoint, again, yeah, we need uh, we need to have these guardrails. Uh, you know, somebody had questioned the or raised the IP question. So the most pressing lawsuits right now um, are around Getty Images is suing um, Stable Diffusion, one of the AI generative models, are uh, one of the more popular ones, because for two reasons: one, um, copyright infringement for um, the copyrighted images. I believe they're also suing for breach of contract for how their data has been used. Um, the other lawsuit that's happening is a class action lawsuit against multiple image generators. And this is being brought by artists whose work was used to build these models. And if these products are commercialized, they are, their argument is you are infringing upon copyrighted content and you are, it, it is creating damage to my career. Um, to give you an example, when Stable Diffusion was first launched, there's an artist, Greg Rutkowski, who, who's known for a particular style. His name was used nearly 100,000 times in one month from people trying to replicate his style. Now, there's a difference if we're talking about personal use versus commercial use. But not coming from a legal background, I would I would say it looks like he's got a pretty good case for damages if this is if this is hurting him financially. So this is something that's going to have to evolve in tandem um, with the you know the technology is great, the regulation needs to happen. Rebecca, I appreciate it. I think you're right. I think we got a lot of content in here. I think you know how we nuts and bolts use these tools and not be afraid of them. To me, yeah, that's the program I would love to offer. Folks, if you're interested in that, you know, love to hear from you on that. Um, that's all I have for today. Thanks for bearing with me. I know I've been talking at a lightning pace, but I want to take a look at kind of the comments that I didn't get a chance to answer um, already. Um, Shasenta, you've got a question here. Is it preferable learning AI or prompt engineering? I think it's complementary skill sets. Yeah, um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I've talked with some of the people who are building these AI algorithms. I have tremendous respect for them because it's a tremendous effort um, going in, you know, to build these models, not just the financial effort, but the skills to get to that point. I mean, you're talking PhD and postdoc computer scientists. Um, whereas prompt engineering, to me, that's the more accessible form of this because a lot of companies, if you're working for large organizations, um, that have the ability to invest in building custom AI, you know, you're going to have an AI team. But other organizations that don't have the resources needed to build these models from scratch, what I like about these models is that they're being made available to, um, to the public, hopefully with some restriction. Open AI, right now, they're testing ChatGPT. You know, they're not open sourcing it, thank God. Um, but they're 
previous generation um, GPT-3 and what I expect for ChatGPT is that it's going to be made available via an API so that other businesses are able to take advantage of the work they've already done. So rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, learn how to use the tool, right? We don't all have to build the same types of AI and be, it'd be incredibly expensive, not only financially, but also costly for the environment. What we can do is, you know, um, and again, this, it's going to be different people. Some people are going to be on the technical side building the AI. I think a lot more people can be on the on the side of doing the prompt engineering, doing the al the algorithmic auditing. Those are you know those are the two immediate jobs that I see being necessary for um, as AI diffuses within society. That's what we need more of, at least immediately. All right, I've gone over time. So thank you so much, everyone, um, for taking the time to join this session. As you can see, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. If you're specific questions that I didn't get to touch on or that you'd like to talk more about, by all means, feel free uh, to reach out to me. Happy to talk more about this topic uh, with, with anyone. So uh, Tammy, let me turn things over to you. All right, thanks, David. Very great topic. We had a lot of interest and thank you so much, David, for your time and the information, a wealth of information. Um, scary topic, but the examples that you shared uh, show that it can be useful. Um, but at the end of the day, as someone pointed out, human makes the final decision. It's our responsible responsibility to use the AI very responsibly. Um, so again, thank you for this morning. Just want to share upcoming business of a breakfast with everyone. On March the 2nd, we're going to have Melissa Williams talk about claiming your power at work. And then on March the 16th, Matt Lau is going to share uh, blockchains and crypto assets, new technologies, old problems. So we're hope that you're able to join us for uh, that conversation. Some upcoming uh, short courses uh, that we want to make you aware of, Design Thinking for Business is going to take place on April the 17th and 18th. That's in person. Executive Communication and Leadership Presence. If you need to build your skills in communications on communicating upward, outward, downward, and outside of your organization, this is a great opportunity and a training for you. And if you got a lot out of David's session this morning and want to continue to build your fundamental understanding of AI and additional concepts of machine learning in a non-technical and a very highly um, interactive format, please join us for AI and machine learning for business on April the 24th and 25th. This will be in person as well. And finally, our finance and accounting for non-financial managers. If you need to strengthen your practical understanding of financial statements, this is a great course for you. This will be live and online May the 15th through the 18th. Um, so if you have any in, any information or any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself um, at the email address there. Thank you all again for your time today. And we hope to see you in a future uh, Business Over Breakfast sessions in March.